What's going on, everybody? This is Brian Mazik of The Fight Guys. I'm also a Forbes contributor, and I want to welcome you all or whoever's here and when, whenever you uh, actually file in to the first ever episode of The Fight Guys Weekly. Now, normally, normally, I will be joined by Peter Kahn. He's the, another fight guy and also a Forbes contributor, but there were some last minute things that popped up, and so I am driving it solo, but I assure you, that I can handle it, no problem. We got a nice agenda to go uh, into. Uh, we're going to be doing this every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time, a little bit later, a little bit late start, but always we'll have an agenda and it's always going to be boxing all the time. So myself personally, and for people who may not be familiar with me, I have uh, been a boxing fan for over 35 years or a long time. First fight I ever saw, I'm giving away my age a little bit, 1981, uh, uh, Thomas Hearns against Sugar Ray Leonard. Crazy because I was crazy enough to think that that's how boxing was going to be all the time, right? So obviously every fight's not as great as that one, but that is the one that got me hooked and got me just to that place. But I've been covering the sport for Bleacher Report and Forbes and other publications for the last 10 to 11 years. So I've uh, been doing this for a minute and uh, like, you know, been covering combat sports overall for a minute because I also cover MMA uh, and I'm also a huge gamer. So I uh, do a lot of sports video games as well. So I'm a I'm, I'm kind of a, a well-rounded guy. I'm I call myself the hardest working man in sports and gaming, and that's for several reasons. But let's talk about what we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about today. There's a lot of stuff going on in boxing. Uh, much of it is, you know, a lot of it is not actually the, the greatest news. Uh, touch a little bit on Maxim uh, Dadashev, unfortunately, the unfortunate story that rocked the boxing world uh, over the past two to three days. Uh, there's also some unfortunate news that uh, that came out on Wednesday night about Dillian White, the recently crowned WBC interim heavyweight champion. Uh, we're still talking Thurman Pacquiao, even though I hope you guys got an opportunity to watch uh, our recap show uh, that we went live two, three o'clock in the morning after the fight was over. So talk a little bit about kind of put a bow on the Thurman Pacquiao uh, conversation. We're also going to talk a little bit about the fights that are coming up this weekend. Uh, you know, the, the show always goes on. We got, you know, Maurice Hooker, uh, Jose Ramirez. We got Javante Davis on the card, uh, all of that. So in, in the body of the Thurman Pacquiao conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about what is next for Thurman and what could be next for Pacquiao. We had a really nice interview with the president of uh, or of, of uh, Manny Pacquiao Promotions, uh, Sean Gibbons. So you'll see that interview a little bit later on in the day, maybe early tomorrow. We'll drop that. And also we'll talk a little bit about what's been going on with Canelo, what might be next up for him. So we're going to jump into all of that. But the first thing we're going to talk about right now is uh, Maxim Dadashev. Unfortunately, the uh, boxing world uh, experienced another uh, fatality based off of in-ring, uh, you know, in-ring action. And it really, I'm going to tell you this, whenever this happens, it, it always, it always kind of rocks me in a way where I literally start to kind of step back and say, man, is this, you know, I know I love this sport and I've loved it for so long, but is this really the the sport that I really want to be around? Because I mean, this is, this is, this is real deal stuff, right? And um, it just really, you know, I, I honestly, I, I wasn't very familiar with, with Dada Shev. I, I mean, I know a lot, uh, I, I deal with boxing on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, there's just so many fighters, you can never know everybody, right? Uh, uh, so I, I wasn't familiar with him and it, it's a, it was a shame to, to come in contact or getting, you know, get acquainted with him in this way. Uh, he had just turned 28 years old on on July 23rd uh, from Russia. Uh, he had a 13 and 0 record. Uh, this loss that he suffered uh, ahead of the unfortunate fatality to Surreal Matias was the first loss of his career. He was 13 and 0 with 11 knockouts. So obviously a very good prospect. Uh, had some really good wins on his record. Antonio Demarco, Deleas Perez. Um, so you know he was definitely an up and coming. Uh, kind of a fighter. It was being mad, uh, trained by Jane, uh, Hall of Famer James Buddy McGirt. 
um, who did stop the fight and was urging Dadashev to, to kind of move on. Uh, but unfortunately, things didn't go uh, as 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 we would have hoped and wanted them to go. So uh, with situations like that, man, the only thing you can do is really just pray for his family. And uh, I know that there are um, uh, some GoFundMes out there for his wife and his son. I'm going to make sure we put the link to that in the description of the video. Um, you know, because it's just really, uh, really just unfortunate, man. Um, and, you know, it's really, really not a whole bunch else that can be said about it. Um, you, like I said, just pray for, I pray for his family, uh, that they are able to get through, um, you know, just to, to get, to get through this uh, obvious tough time. So, um, in other news, uh, Dillian White, uh just won the wbc interim heavyweight championship um uh this past weekend actually the same day as thurman pacquiao he beat uh beat oscar rivas um got dropped in the fight uh didn't look really didn't look great to be totally honest he definitely didn't look his best uh looked heavy heavier than normal and uh it came out today that he he failed uh, a post-fight drug test. So now White obviously has some issues. And I'm going to tell you, and this is information that's coming, you know, from uh, uh, Peter Kahn, who is the other fight guy you, who you generally will be with me. But if you know anything about the WBC, and, and like I said, I'm speaking this directly from what, you know, Peter's experience and for you guys that don't know Peter, you'll know, find out he is a manager of several fighters. He manages Dennis Hogan, George Cambosis Jr., Ryan Martin, Chris Van Eerden. He's dealt with the WBC exclusively or extensively. And failing a drug test with the WBC, it, it, with anything associated with them, is a very serious occurrence. So Dillian White was just trying to put himself in a position you know, basically to be the mandatory challenger for Deontay Wilder's WCB, WBC title. And now, obviously, all of that is in jeopardy with this. So to be clear, his A sample was dirty. Of course, a lot of fighters um, request for the B sample to uh, to be pulled. But in my experience across all combat sports, very rarely, I, I'm off the top of my head, I can't even think of an instance where that B sample was pulled and something different took place. Now, I don't want to speculate at all about what may or may not be going on with uh, Dillian White. I don't know. All I know is that he looked very much out of shape. Um, and that in itself, you know, can lead you down some different, different types of speculation. You don't really know. Um, where um you know where this is all going and, and i see somebody in the chat saying it's serious when you're not canelo and i actually said the same exact thing z i really did initially but i will tell you this um when canelo did fail the drug test it did at least blow the rematch up right so the rematch didn't happen at that time it had to get postponed now maybe if that happened on on someone else's watch maybe it wouldn't have happened. So the WBC by any means is no way at all a perfect governing body. There is no perfect governing body. If you want to be honest, they all have some stuff about them that, you know, contribute to the negativity in the sport. But um, yeah, um, it, it's a, he's in a situation for sure right now. And it, the timing couldn't be worse. The timing couldn't be worse. Um, a fight with Deontay Wilder, while I would definitely lean towards Wilder, this would have been the biggest payday Dillian White has had in his career. Uh, the biggest opportunity he's had since he was stopped by Anthony Joshua. Now, I firmly would expect for Deontay to knock Dillian White out. Um, Dillian White has traditionally been too easy to touch throughout his career. And we all know what the consequences are of getting touched flush by Deontay Wilder. You know, that getting up off the deck stuff that Tyson Fury did that I totally believe that was an aberration. That is not anything you're going to be able to see consistently from any heavyweight. Uh, I, I, I believe that Deontay Wilder is truly one of the two to three hardest punches in the heavyweight in heavyweight history. Uh, you know, right in that Ernie Shavers, Mike Tyson, George Foreman kind of, a, uh, you know, category. So 
yeah, he's got a he's got a situation going on there. So we will see what happens as this developer will find out what the consequences may be um, moving forward. But it does not look good at all for uh, Dillian White right now. So we'll see how it, it um, how it shakes out. Uh, in other news, uh, we got Canelo Sergey Derevchenko, which may actually be happening. So. Uh, Sergey Derevyanchenko is the mandatory challenger for the IBF title, which is the title that Canelo just won from Daniel Jacobs in his last fight. Now, initially, it did not seem as though Canelo and his team were or were overly enthused about taking on Derevyanchenko. Now, Canelo would almost certainly he's 100% going to be favored to beat him but i think everybody knows in the in the in the in, in the boxing world that the revianchenko is no walk in the park he's also not a major name so this represents a high risk low reward type of a situation so traditionally this is not something that canelo or a fighter of his star level would would really be wanting to take on especially when there are potentially bigger paydays out there on the horizon like a triple g trilogy like some sort of fight at Sir, with sergey kovalev at 175 or even a fight at 168 against callum smith and if you you know subscribe to this channel and you've watched some of the videos we put up there you know i don't think callum smith is a good matchup for canelo at all so uh but there have been some recent reports out there that are saying that uh canelo and his team may be warming up to this fight with dereva yachinko um and so we'll see what happens a lot of this here here's something that everybody needs to understand a lot of this is based on the zone accepting the opponent so golden boy and 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 canelo can pitch any opponent that they want they can talk about fighting this guy that guy um you know i happen to know for a fact that canelo's team tried to float and golden boy tried to float the jaime mungia concept out but the zone would not accept it so the zone has major sway in this situation and if they are trying to you know bring in an opponent that the network or the streaming service is not going to accept then that fight is not going to happen so um the derevi yachinko thing we'll find out what the final verdict is there i wouldn't be surprised to see it happen sometime later in the fall um this, the Kovalev fight's not going to happen. They're pretty much locked in the Anthony Yard for August 24th. So that's not going to happen. I believe Callum Smith is probably going to go uh, against Billy Joe Saunders, which is a pretty interesting fight. So we'll see how that goes as well. But yeah, it's, it's going to be, uh, I think, an interesting uh, last half of the year for Canelo. Also, don't sell short the potential knee injury. He's been having that knee wrapped up in fights. And I think that it may be a bit more serious than what is being led on. So we'll find out, you know, what really is, uh, what's the deal with that overall. So um, it's going to be interesting. Um, the another, the next thing we want to talk about is Thurman Pacquiao. So I'm going to go back a little bit with that. Um, if you saw our recap, you know, both Peter and I acknowledged, full-fledged, we did not pick Pacquiao. Neither of us picked him. Um, and we were both, I'm going to be honest, I don't have anything against Kermit Keith Thurman at all, but we were both pleasantly surprised with the performance that a 40 year old future hall of famer put on, you know, both of us scored the fight. Actually, we both scored the fight, the exact same thing. And we weren't anywhere close to each other at all. We weren't even talking during the fight, but we both scored the fight 114 and 113 for Pacquiao, which is something the official scores were 115 to 112 twice for Pacquiao. 114 to 113 once for Thurman. I don't really, if you look at the actual scorecards, it's kind of, you know, a little bit perplexing to see how the judge, I think it was Glenn Feldman that scored it 114 to 113 for Thurman. Um, it's kind of weird. I mean, it was a very close fight. Thurman outlanded Pacquiao overall and outlanded them with power punches, which is usually an indication that a fighter got the best of them. But I, I'm going to tell you why I scored the fight for Pacquiao. Um, damage and the effectiveness of punching is a huge thing, right? Um, when Pacquiao touched Thurman, there was a, there was far more of a reaction, 
far more damage done with the shots. Obviously, we know we got the knockdown in the first round. We got the huge body shot in the 10th round that I felt I felt saved the fight for Pacquiao. Um, and then we had several other, you know, combinations and things like that that landed. Now, Thurman was squaring Pacquiao up on a se on several occasions, hit him really good. But I just thought that Pacquiao took those shots much better than Thurman took the shots from him. And uh, like I said, I felt Pacquiao really saved the fight in the 10th round because I felt that Pacquiao had built a lead early in the fight, uh, especially springboarding off of the knockdown. But then as we got into six, seven, eight, nine range, I felt that Thurman was just stacking rounds. And, and he had, on my card, eliminated the deficit. And in the 10th round, he got hit with the body shot that badly hurt him. He turned and retreated, took the mouthpiece out of his mouth to try to create some sort of airway. And I thought that that not only did that wrap up a very crucial round, it totally stopped Thurman's momentum and kind of pushed Pacquiao back going forward. Now, I did give Thurman the 11th round, but then in the 12th round, I thought that a looping left hand from Pacquiao seemed to wobble Thurman. And I thought Pacquiao fought more spirited and had more aggression in that uh, 12th and final round. And that's how he ended up breaking a 113-113 tie. On my card right so one of the questions you want to ask now or most people are asking is what is next for thurman right now i did an entire video we did the video i i supported and came through with my my uh probably unpopular opinion but i will say that it's a a, a relatively bold opinion uh i really like i said i felt that you know keith thurman should strongly consider walking away like i just don't believe that thurman has the the same fire that he had in 2015, 2016, before the injuries, before the marriage, everything, right? And I don't think there's any shame in that, right? Because we're all human beings, go through different stages in our life. Our motivations are at different levels, uh, at different times. And it's not a choice necessarily. It's just something that kind of happens. Uh, Keith Thurman is a very intelligent guy. He has a future as a broadcaster. Uh, he knows that. and Sometimes subconsciously, when you know you have options, then it changes the way you deal with your primary situation. And I'm not implying that Thurman didn't fight hard on Saturday. I think he did. But now falling off the wagon, falling off the undefeated train, do we truly believe that Thurman has what it takes to come back and beat the Errol Spences, the, 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 the Sean Porters, the Danny Garcias and others uh, right there in that PBC envelope. Do we think he can do that uh, enough to get back to where he was? I, I just don't know. But uh, I say all that to say, uh, I say all that to say that it, I can understand him walking away, but I truly don't think that he will. Um, I think, you know, he's been talking about he wants a rematch with Pacquiao. I strongly doubt that'll happen. I, I have, there's no reason in the world why I can see Pacquiao giving anybody a rematch outside of Mayweather. I just, not. Nah, I just don't. He'll be 41 years old in December. Um, you know, he knows that that end is coming. He's got, you know, and it doesn't make any sense for him to look back and fight Keith Thurman over again. I mean, he he's are he's already beaten him. You know, I just don't see why he would do that. So I think that one's out. But I do think it's possible that uh we could get Thurman Adrian Broner, assuming Adrian Broner beats Ivan Redcatch, who is it hasn't been officially announced that that's his new, his next opponent, but most people in boxing circles know that uh, Red Catch is next for Broner. Now, Red Catch has some talent, and he's a tough dude and comes forward, and he's, he's an action fighter. And we know that with Broner, he hasn't been, he's been having a problem pulling the trigger. So it could be interesting. But if Broner does win, I think there's real intrigue with Thurman Broner. And I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why. I wrote an article because there was uh, some rumors and some speculation going around. Uh, and I'll try to put the link to this article in the description of the video, but there was some confusion going around and, and there was talk after Broner lost to uh, Pacquiao and was before Thurman Pacquiao was announced that Broner and Thurman were going to be matched together. Uh, and I wrote an article and I think my headline was something like, if PBC gives Thurman the uh, gives Broner the Thurman, they must be trying to eliminate the problem. You know, 
And apparently that must have gotten back <laughs> to uh, Broner and Thurman and Broner got upset about it. He started going at Thurman, you know, and, and it, that might have caused some sort of issue. But now the fight makes even more sense than it did then. Now we got a matchup between the last two guys who faced and lost to Manny Pacquiao. So it would seem to make some sense uh, for, um, you know, it would seem to make some sense for that to take place. So I don't know. I don't know. We, we have to find out uh, what happens. But I, I think that that fight makes a lot of sense, especially if Broner beats Red Catch. And it, especially if, if he were to stop him, you know, it would be a, a big deal. But more than anything, we know Broner has to start throwing some punches. He does. Um, outside of that, there's some fringe people that Thurman could fight. Uh, on the outside, perhaps he gets the loser of Spence Porter, which could end up being a rematch with Porter. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine Porter beating Spence. Uh, I do think it's Porter's going to be Spence's toughest opponent, but I still, you know, definitely believe that Spence wins. So that's one we'll we'll have to see what happens. Now, as far as with Pacquiao, I think obviously the thought process is to say, well, oh, he can just get the winner of Spence Porter. And that guy, you know, Spencer Porter will have both the WBC and the IBF titles. And then Pacquiao has the WBA title. They can have a unification bout and the winner will have three titles. And the only other person for left for them to fight would be WBO champion Terrence uh, Crawford, which obviously has a bunch of stuff attached to it because he fights with top rank in ESPN. But there's another side to that. And I think it's the one that Pacquiao would prefer. And you're going to hear a little bit more about this. When you see the um, interview that we did with Sean Gibbons, who is the president of Mayweather, um, Matt Mayweather, he's the president of Manny Pacquiao Promotions. So, um, but there's a lot of ways for him to go. I, I think Pacquiao definitely wants Mayweather. And it makes total sense, right? It makes absolute sense. First of all, he lost to him. So some revenge factor is there. Second of all, there is nobody else in the world that, that Pacquiao can make as much money fighting. Like Pacquiao's going to make a good amount of money fighting anyway because he's Manny Pacquiao and he's his own draw. But now you got two significant draws in there together. And while they might not make what they made in 2015, they're going to still make a significant amount. And, you know, if if you're in boxing and you're trying to maximize risk, which at their at the stage of his career, you, you kind of got to think about that. Uh, and I think Sean Gibbons is going to kind of talk to that, um, uh, speak to that as well. Um, Mayweather, I think, you know, you know, if you lose the Mayweather, you're going to get outboxed. You're not going to get knocked out. And, you know, you're not going to take necessarily the same amount of punishment as you would take from an Errol Spence or even a Keith Thurman. Uh, so if you mix all of that in and you do risk reward and you say, how can I make the most money? How can I put myself in the least line of uh, to be calmed physically? Everything points to Mayweather. So, of course, Pacquiao wants to do it. But essentially, they're they're more than likely just waiting on Mayweather to see what he's going to do. Is he going to sign off on it? Is he going to do it? Um, I got a video coming out that it's called Five Reasons that it seems the Mayweather-Pacquiao rematch is becoming more and more likely. So be on the lookout for that video because uh, I break it down pretty consistently. They are pretty, pretty extensively. And... Um, I think it's interesting. There's a lot going on that would make you think it's going down. Twitter beefs, a lot of stuff. Sounds like they're building a fight to me. So let's talk about, let's do it now. One thing we're going to do moving forward, especially when we have Peter there, is we're going to do some kind of nostalgia stuff. Peter has been around boxing for over 25 years. He used to work for Don King. He was a manager of Robert Garcia when he was a fighter, a world champion. Uh, he's managed Michael Moore, former heavyweight champion, just been around that sport for a long time, right? So uh, we were going over some stuff, and, and I don't want to give it away too much because I want it to be really cool when we do our first episode with it. But there's a segment that we're going to do with Peter about that, and it is really about boxing history, boxing nostalgia. So if you are a real, real boxing head, I think you will enjoy that particular segment. Now, um, looking at the uh chat i see people's voice huge pacquiao fan is in the chat and he is giving a shout out to the to the senator one of the greatest fighters of all time definitely see him and uh it, he is clearly proud of manny pacquiao 
world beater fighting is in the chat i appreciate you coming through as well uh z was the first guy in and first one uh commenting i definitely appreciate that too um but let's talk about the fights this weekend okay there are um it's a it's a moderately interesting card is what I, a moder moderately interesting lineup of fights i should say um the most popular fighter fighting this weekend is javante davis but javante is in the ring basically with a guy who is more than likely going to be overmatched in ricardo nunez davis is going to be defending his wba uh, junior lightweight title now ricardo nunez when you look at his record he uh he is a he's a 25 year old panamanian nickname is el scientifico but when you look at his record to 21 and 2 with 19 knockouts one law one of his losses is by a ko when you look at the record it seems really impressive right but then you start to look at who he's beaten right and just to put this in the proper perspective in april the end of April, which this is, um, this was, you know, this was, uh, uh, Nunez's last fight. He beat Eduardo Pacheco, whose record is, was 22 and 30 and three beat him in Panama city by first round knockout. Now he's had some good wins over the likes of Elvis Torres, but most of the fighters that he's fought have not been anybody that you more than likely have ever heard of. As a matter of fact, he's only had up to now, he's only had three fights that were scheduled for longer than 10 rounds in his career. So this is not a guy who is expected to really push Javante Davis. And to be honest with you, this is one of the biggest criticisms that Javante has right now. Um, and I, I think people who are in the know, they know that uh, this really isn't on Javante. Right, because he's not making these decisions. You listen to Javante talk, he wants everybody. He wants Tevin Farmer, he wants Vasil Lomachenko, he wants everybody. But the people on his team, Mayweather and everybody else that are pulling the strings, are somewhat protecting him. They're they don't want him to step out and have too significant of a challenge and perhaps lose early. And they're really subscribing to this need to maintain type of a profile. And I really think it's kind of hurting him. I really do. I'm going to tell you, it, it's kind of hurting him. Javante is such a, a, a magnetic type of a star. There's going to be a point where they, they're going to have to take a chance with him. They're going to have to take a chance. going to have to get him in the ring with somebody of some major significance. Uh, I see uh, Killam the Pro is saying Javante Davis versus Tevin uh, Farmer needs to happen. It absolutely does. But Tevin Farmer is a fantastic, fantastic amateur fighter. And well, I mean, it's a fantastic fighter with a great amateur pedigree. And that's a tough, I mean, everybody knows that's a tough, I mean, you, I mean, you listen to Tank, he's saying it's not a tough fight, but of course he's going to say that, but that would clearly be the best opponent that Javante has faced. I mean, right now, if you had to really ask yourself, who is the best opponent that Javante has been in the ring with? I mean, I'm going to look back at it, but off the top of my head, I would have to say, was it Jose Pedraza? Is that his best victory? I mean, Jose Pedraza is a former world champion, a, a a good fighter, but I mean, I mean, you could say Jesus Cuellar, he he was a good fighter. He knocked him out in the third round. I, I just don't know. I mean, some might say Cuellar, but he hasn't fought anybody, guys. He really has not fought anyone yet. So he doesn't deserve to be grouped in with the truly elite guys. Not yet. 21 and 0, 20 knockouts. Tank can punch. He can punch with any super featherweight there is, probably punching with the lightweights as well, and maybe even the super lightweights. But he needs to get in the ring with somebody of some significance, and that has not happened yet, and it is not happening this weekend in his hometown of Baltimore. Also on that card, you get Yuri Orcas Gamboa against Rocky Martinez, Jezreel Corrales versus Ladarius Miller, and it is going to be televised on Showtime. So if you're looking for uh, a fight to watch, um, you you know, um, that's one of the cards you have to choose from. Now, just so happens, my man Tevin Farmer is fighting on the same day. They seem to be on the same schedules qu quite often, to be honest. They fight either the same day or within a week or so of each other. So, you know, 
the timing definitely matches up. But Tevin Farmer will be in with Guillerme Freno, uh, Frenoy, or Frenois, Frenois, I believe it is. I haven't seen him fight, so I don't know much about him. Uh, Farmer's IBF junior lightweight title was going to be on the line. Uh, not a huge fight, obviously. It's the co-main event on this card in from uh, from Arlington, Texas. The title fight that everybody's talking about, and in my opinion, the biggest fight of the weekend is Maurice Hooker versus Jose Ramirez. For the uh, it's a unification about the WBO WBC Junior World to Weight Championship. Um, Hooker is uh, an underrated guy, in my opinion. His long arm skill, deceptive power, uh, and just a slick boxer. Jose Ramirez, though, is like a workhorse, man. He's a workhorse, constantly coming forward. He throws punches from different angles. His 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 his, his defense is much better than what you would you would expect when you first see him start to fight. I think he is really a sleeper star right now in the sport that isn't quite getting the type of uh, accolades that he deserves. Uh, I think Hooker Ramirez is a fantastic fight. Um, can't wait to watch that one. That one is going to be streamed exclusively on the zone. So if, if I had to give you a recommendation of the one fight you need to see this weekend, if you don't see any other fights for me, that one is going to be Maurice Hooker versus Jose Ramirez. I'm not expecting anything beneath a fantastic fight for that. Um, you know, so uh, overhand says Tank is the best 130 pounder in his opinion. He doesn't feel like claiming the throne yet. You know, uh, he might be. He might be. Javante Davis might very well be the best 130 pounder in the world. If that proved to be the case, I would not be surprised. But at some point, he's got to, he's got to step it up. They they got to take the training wheels off of him and let him go out there and ride it, ride that bike for itself. I mean, you can see the talent. You can see the explosiveness. You can see the fact that when Javante lands on most 130 pounders, it's a different type of situation than when most 130 pounders land. And that's something that I don't think is going to change because he starts fighting better fighters. I think how much he gets touched might change. Maybe his accuracy changes because he's now fighting slicker guys. But that talent is real. It's real. But now he needs to get the W's so that the talent and the record and the quality of the fighters on the record begin to match. So I think that that's where he is right now. So, uh, like I said, it's going to be going to be an interesting, uh, that, that, uh, not that fight, but it's going to be an interesting weekend. But I mean, let's be honest. Javante is going to knock out Ricardo Nunez in, inside three rounds. I, I, if Ricardo Nunez sees the fourth round, I will be shocked. I will be shocked, dumbfounded, led astray, run amok <laughs> if that happens. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it taking place. So, uh, but it is boxing and anything can happen. All right. So let's, it's time for the nostalgia portion of this, um, of this particular episode. Uh, and let's talk about the top five. Now, this is, this is just, this is my opinion. Now, this is my opinion. The top five victories in Manny Pacquiao's career. Now, Manny Pacquiao, if you if you look at his record, man, I mean, it it, it almost it almost seems unreal. 62 7 and 2, 39 knockouts, right? Fantastic career, 62 victories. So, I took the time to actually thumb through and and having seen most or if not all of the fights that Manny has had since 2001, maybe, um, or maybe the middle part of 2001. I don't know that there's a fight that of Manny's that I haven't seen in that time period. Um, so it's a lot of fights. It's a lot, right? But so I challenge myself to come up with the top five. I, I would love to see what you guys have as a list. If you're watching this after I went live, you can post that in the, uh, there. But if you have it in the chat, you, you want to take a shot. I'd love to see what you guys have. Um, but you know, here's my top five, right? Number five, the TKO of Eric Morales in 2006. Now he, he actually defeated Eric Morales twice in 2006. I'm talking about the first one, 
the first victory is it, there was a part of Pacquiao's career there in the mid, mid 2000s where essentially every single person in his weight region, he was just, he was annihilating them, you know? And I remember always thinking that before he initially fought Eric Morales, I was like, I don't know, man, you know, uh, he's tough. He's long. I thought the size and the length and the power would give Manny some problems. And of course he did give him, you know, hurt Manny in the epic fight that Manny stopped him late, which is the one I'm talking about. Um, but Pacquiao pushing his way through that fight against a truly elite opponent. To me, that's number five on the list. Some people might even have that one high, right? The fourth biggest fight I saw, and this is the fight when I knew, I'm like, this dude is different. You know, Lalo uh, Ledwaba in June of 2001, right? Just a, a, a small tidbit of information. That fight was the first time I believe Pacquiao ever fought in Las Vegas. So it's kind of become a home away from home for him. But Pacquiao had no problems really uh, dis disposing of Ledwaba. I mean, and anybody who didn't know yet should have gotten the memo at that point. That was June of 2001. Pacquiao won by six round TKO. Ledwaba was 33 and one coming into the fight. So clearly an elite fighter. And that fight um, won Pacquiao the IBF uh, Super, Bantam, uh, Super Bantamweight title. Of course, he is the only eight division champion in boxing history. So my number three fight uh, was Pacquiao scoring a TKO victory over Marco Antonio Barrera in 2003 to win a Super Bantamweight title. Uh, this was the beginning, really, of Pacquiao taking on the truly the best Mexican fighters in the world. And he kicked off a can like a long run, like from, from November of 2003, all the way through, man, you could say all the way through November of 2006, Pacquiao almost exclusively fought Mexican greats. And he beat them all with the exception of the unanimous decision lost to Eric Morales in March of 2005. Uh, but the victory here that, that I'm mentioning over Barrera was a fantastic performance by, by Pacquiao uh, against a truly elite opponent. And that's really what makes these, what makes these accomplishments all, all the more better. I mean, he was, he, I mean, he was nasty. He was hit that. I mean, as good as Pacquiao is now and as good as he looked against Thurman, if you saw him in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, in those smaller weight classes, you would know why people are the way they are about Pacquiao as a fighter. I mean, the, fer the ferocity. <laughs> you, think, you think that when he gets hit now and he does that up, slaps the gloves together, you think that, that it's on a different level. It's drastically decreased from where it used to be. Um, and you think the speed is something now he was faster than, and the punch was bigger than because he was fighting in a lower weight class. So, uh, definitely. Um, but for me, number two is beating Oscar De La Hoya in 2008. That fight was not for a title or anything like that, but he did to De La Hoya what Keith Thurman vowed to do to him. He retired him. He retired a great. He retired an all-time great. He literally made an all-time great understand that this sport wasn't for him anymore. You know, now obviously maybe De La Hoya had some other stuff going on at the time. It is what it is, but he literally quit on the stool. He quit on the stool in the eighth round, did not come out. Pacquiao was just too much at this time. And now he's up fighting at 145 at this point. Fighting at 145, this was uh, December of 2008. For me, all of the things that are attached to that fight, all of the situations, everything, all things considered. Now, And also think about this. Pacquiao is going to be 41 years old in December. We're talking about 11 years ago. He was 30 years old. So he wasn't like a, a young, young, young man and still at this point. He was towards the end of the prime or what most would consider his prime. So uh, that's my number two fight.
Now, my number one fight is probably going to surprise some people. But if you read my articles on Forbes, then you probably know what direction um, that I'm going. Um, now, Overhand says the Barrera fight was his best performance, in his opinion. I think that was his first fight at featherweight. It was it. To be honest, if you go between 2000 and say 2007, you can pick just about any of those fights, any of those wins, especially the stoppage wins. And you, 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 no one can really say you're wrong, right? No one can really say like, ah, no, absolutely not, right? So that was definitely a great performance. My number one fight, number one performance for Pacquiao was Saturday night. And I know some people are like, what? But let me, let me just... Let me just put this into perspective. Manny Pacquiao is a senator in the Philippines. He's 40 years old. He's about to be 41 years old. He is fighting all the way up at 147, which, of course, he's been fighting there for about eight to nine years, eight maybe 10 years now. And he beats a man 10 years his junior. Now, obviously, yeah, we can talk about the fact that Thurman... Um, you know, was out off for a while, uh, almost two years. We can talk about all of that stuff. But but he beat a guy who was 30 years old, 10, almost 11 years younger than him. And we're talking about a dude who was a year and a half, two years ago, was considered arguably the best welterweight in the world. Drops him in the first round and wins a close fight. I said this before the fight, and I got to stick to my guns. I said if Pacquiao beat Thurman, it would be the greatest accomplishment in his career, all things considered. Now, have have there been moments or fights where he looked better, that he was a better fighter than he was on Saturday? Yes. But all things considered, with everything he's got going on, age, other responsibilities, strength of opponent, all of those things, to me, there's never been any fight that he's had that was more impressive than what he did on Saturday night. Uh, it was, um, it, it was, it was real deal. It was real deal. It was real deal. So that's my number one without a question. So um, we're going to move into this week's fights. I didn't give you my predictions, right? So this is what we're going to do, right? So Peter and I, we're going to give our predictions for the televised main events, co-main events, the bigger fights that are coming up each weekend. And we're going to pick the, the fighter that we that we think is going to win. We're going to th- we're going to try to pick the, the method of victory. Is he going to win by decision? Is he going to win by stoppage? And then we, if it is a stoppage, we're going to try to pick the round that he won. So every week for every fight, we got three possible points. One point if we pick the winner correctly. Two points if we pick the 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 method of victory. And a third point, if we can pick the round. So if we can be specific enough to pick the round. And we're going to keep like a running tally of our accuracy for our predictions. Now, thankfully, we're starting this this week because both of us would have been in the hole because we both picked Thurman to beat Pacquiao. And that didn't happen. So let's talk about some of the fights, like I said, that we were talking about before. We really only got to go over three fights, really. Um, I, I, I think... Just the main event of the Showtime card, Javante Davis against Rick, uh, Ricardo Nunez. Now, we won't start keeping the standings yet because Peter's not here. So I'm just going to do this one just for, I'm going to call this one a practice round, right? So I got Javante Davis, KO of Ricardo Nunez in the second round. Second round. I'm, I'm thinking third, but I'm going to go ahead and say second round KO. Javante Davis knocks out Ricardo Nunez. I don't think the kid has anything, any business in the ring with him. He, he, you look at his KO numbers, and it would appear that he punches hard, uh, but we haven't seen him in there with good con, uh, with good competition. If you go to YouTube, you're on YouTube now. If you open up a separate window and you search him, Ricardo Nunez, uh, and you, you better off searching one of his opponent's names as well, because obviously Ricardo Nunez is not that um, rare of a name. Uh, you search one of his opponent's names too. You should be able to watch a, a, a full fight, and you'll see kind of what I mean. There's no way. I just can't imagine. I mean, it's boxing. Crazy things happen, but I just can't really imagine it, right? Now, um, Tevin Farmer against Guillaume uh, Frenois. Um, I got Tevin Farmer winning this fight. 
And I got Tevin Farmer winning this fight by a eighth round TKO. I think Frenois gives him a little bit tougher of a fight than what uh, we can expect um, Nunez to give Javante Davis. I think the, the, the competition is obviously a little bit a little tougher for him, but I still think Tevin Farmer wins. I also predict that they will go at each other in some way, shape, or form on social media afterwards. Uh, but Maurice Hooker, Jose Ramirez is the real one. That's the tough one, right? To show you how tough of a call it is. Now, Ramirez is the favorite. He is the favorite to win. But we're not talking about long, crazy odds here at all. According to mybookie.ag, uh, Jose Ramirez right now is a minus 135 favorite. Maurice Hooker is a plus 115 underdog. So for every $100 you bet on Maurice Hooker, if you write, you get $115 back. $100 bet pays you about $215. Um, just to let you know, just I'm going to throw these odds out here for you. Javante Davis is a minus 5,000. <laughs> a minus 5,000 favorite over Ricardo Nunez. Like, that shouldn't even, like... They should replace that on my bookie instead of saying my five thousand, just minus five thousand. They should say, Don't even worry about it. They should just, just write, Don't even worry about it. Because if you're minus five thousand, it's some difference going on. Ricardo only is a plus fifteen hundred uh underdog. You bet a hundred dollars, you get sixteen hundred dollars back if this guy pulls an upset. Don't do it, he's not gonna do it. <laughs> Tevin Farmer's a minus two, a two, uh, 2290 favorite. And uh, Guillermo Frenoy is plus 1180. So he's he's almost in Nunez territory. So neither fighter is going to get seriously tested uh, because both fighters are fighting on the same night and they're both fighting uh, guys who, you know, we all expect them to run through. Uh, perhaps there is some sort of deal that's being worked on. I hope that that's the case. But getting back to the Ramirez hooker fight, like I said, minus 135 for Ramirez. Um, I'm going to go with Ramirez. I'm going to go with Ramirez by split decision. Uh, I think these guys are really well matched. I think a split decision, and I think it's a fight that ends up spawning a rematch. Um, I, I just I, I just think it is. I, 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 it's one of those fights that's going to be so tight. You know, and overhand is saying that Ramirez work rate, it, it is, man. And he is such a uh, a precise, effective, precision puncher, you know, especially on the inside. He's just got a, I think Ramirez is one of the most underrated fighters in the world. Like, I legit feel like, like his name should be mentioned in a little bit more esteemed of a group. Because I think he's really that good of a fighter. But this is the fight for him. Like, he's had other good fights before uh, against Amir Amam and others. He's had some good fights. Even though Amir Amam wasn't quite himself at that fight. But some of that, I believe, had to do with Jose Ramirez because he's that good. But um, this this guy, man, he he's the real deal. He is the real deal. And he's going to get a really good chance to show everybody that he is. Um, because he, he, he's in there with a good fighter. He's in there with Maurice Hooker. We're talking about two guys that are undefeated. Maurice Hooker does have three draws on his record, which is one of the reasons why I'm thinking the judge, I mean, when you got a guy who tends to fight in close fights as much as Hooker, you, you know, that's something that kind of just consistently happens. And so you think about there always being a tight score. But I think um, that the work rate will be a factor for Ramirez. And I think that he ends up winning the fight uh, by a split decision. And I, like I said, I would not be shocked at all to see that fight spawn a um, uh, a rematch. So um, Jerome Mesa says that Manny is the best from the Philippines, but Thurman also shows heart and courage. I think in time, Thurman will be the welterweight kingpin if Bud Crawford, uh, uh, if not Bud Crawford, um, or Errol Spence. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think I can't imagine, like I said earlier, I can't imagine Thurman rising back up again. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure who the best welterweight in the world is anymore. Uh, right now I'm not because I, I still need to see uh, Errol Spence beat a really significant opponent. Um, I kind of think he is, but I'm not 
100% sold on it yet because his best win is over a broken Kale Brook and an undersized Mikey Garcia, you know. Uh, so to me, beating Sean Porter will be significant if he can do that. Uh, and that may incline me to push him there. But ultimately, once whatever is settled with whatever this little makeshift weird kind of tournament that is going on with PBC, once whoever emerges out of that winds up coming in there and taking on Crawford, hopefully Aram and PBC can come to agreement. That's when we'll really find out definitively who the best welterweight in the world is. So we'll find out. Um, um, so Overhand asks, who has the home field advantage? Hooker or Ramirez. Um, the fight is is in Arlington. I think that, like, I mean, um, it's tough because obviously in Arlington, you're gonna have a a a solid uh, uh Mexican contingent there. Um, Jose Carlos Ramirez is born in the United States, but um, I believe he is a Mexican American, so uh he will have some fans there. But when you look at uh Maurice Hooker. Uh, Maurice Hooker is, you know, from Dallas. So, you know, he, this is, we're talking about cowboy country straight up. So it is tough. It, it, it could be split, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know it, it, that, that overhand, that's a great question. It's a, it's a great question. It really is because the, here, here's what this breaks down to, right? This breaks down to this. This breaks down to, is Ramirez a big enough Mexican fighter in terms of popularity to supersede the geographical advantage that Hooker would, would, would seemingly have? That's the question. Like, so if Jose Carlos Ramirez was fighting Errol Spence in Arlington, I think no doubt Errol Spence gets the home field advantage, home court. You know, he's going to have the fans because I think that he's significant of enough of a star in Dallas and from Texas. Maurice Hooker's not Errol Spence from a notoriety standpoint. He's not. But then Jose Carlos Ramirez isn't Canelo Alvarez. He ain't even Mikey Garcia. So it's it really could be split. It really could be split. I don't really know uh, how it's going to happen. Um, so it's going to, that one's definitely going to be interesting. Uh, to, it's going to be interesting to watch the fight, but it's also going to be interesting to listen to the crowd and see if it, this is a pro Ramirez or pro hooker crowd. It's, that's going to be interesting to see. Jerome Mesa says, Tia Fimo or Richard Comey? If you would have asked me that question two months ago, I would have leaned towards saying Tia Fimo. But I think that's a very tough fight to call. It's a very tough fight to call. Uh, I don't, I don't, um, I don't bash Tiafimo as much as some people for this loss to Nakatani. I feel like Nakatani is one of those guys that's just really tough to look good against. Like he's almost like not not nearly as skilled or whatever. But when I say tough to look good against, it's almost like fighting Winky Wright. So if anybody knows anything about Winky Wright, it was tough to look good against Winky Wright. Not only was he a good fighter, he just had this awkward style, great defense, tough to hit him with anything flush. And it, it just, you know, and Nakatani was just an awkward fighter. And it was it was tough. Tia, but I give Tia Fimo a lot of credit because people forget how young he still is and how inexperienced he still is. But for him to pull out that victory in a tough situation like that, I give him credit. But Comey's a professional. Like, He's a professional. And when I say he's a professional, he's consistent. He's well-rounded. He's got good boxing skills, good power, um, nice, even-keeled mindset. Uh, we did an interview, or Peter Kahn did an interview with uh, Comey that's on our channel now. Just peep him out. And just look at the way he approaches things. Uh, comes, obviously, from the fantastic bo boxing tradition from Accra, Ghana. Just great pedigree, right? So I don't really know. Um, um, I don't know. I, that one's, that one's tough. I'm going to go still lean, lean towards Tiafimo. I think he's just a more spectacular athlete, but I would say Comey might be the more sound boxer, right? Uh, overhand says, should Tiafimo pull back from being moved, from moving so fast? Um, he is escalating quickly, but I don't think it's, I think he's a special fighter. I do think he's a special fighter from a from a talent standpoint. I think he's 
I think he is. Is he ready for Lomachenko? Like he's as I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. But um, but I know he's moving into that stratosphere where it's say for instance, you know, he fights Comey and he wins. It's like, what else are you gonna do? Man, Mikey Mikey Garcia or somebody, I don't know. Uh, and then I don't know how that's gonna happen because it looks like Garcia's gonna sign with the zone. So um, it's gonna, you know, that also is gonna be interesting. I don't, I'm not gonna say he should be pulled back because sometimes I think if a fighter is really truly gifted and special. I think that um, they have a different timeline than maybe another guy. So um, from what I hear, um, um, Tag um, Pacquiao Thurman, they they're hoping there's 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 a possibility that it's between six hundred to seven hundred thousand pay per view buys. That's 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 a win, man. That's and, and I'm going to tell you something. Thurman's trash talk deserves a lot of credit for that i mean it deserves a lot of credit for it because you know pacquiao's pacquiao and he's his own draw i mean it's not a lot of fighters in the world that got an entire country behind him but thurman's trash talk took this thing to another level and um he deserved you know he deserves some credit for the bias that this does i mean because i think this is going to come close to doubling the broner fight from a pay-per-view buy standpoint which is pretty significant. It's another reason, going back to the original topic we had at, the had at the beginning of the show, which is another reason why Mayweather Pacquiao rematch is um is more likely. Because look at Pacquiao's pay-per-view buys, man. You know, <laughs> this is this is the real deal, man. This is the real deal. So uh I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off here, guys. I, I, I really appreciate everybody who chimed in, who came through. This is every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time next week. Uh, unless, you know, you know, you know, something happens where uh, something happens where we, you know, it won't be Peter and I again, uh, Peter and I for the first time. It will be him. It will be, a, 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 you know, we'll, we'll have a, a duo here as opposed to me holding it down solo. Uh, but I, like I said, I appreciate everybody watching. If you have not liked this video yet, please do. If you have not uh, subscribed to the channel yet, please do that. Uh, and also don't forget to click the notifications bell because that'll let you know when the videos are dropping. Also, uh, on our channel right now, there are links to our Instagram page as well as our uh, Twitter account. So if you're not following us on those social media accounts, also do that. Uh, and keep a lookout. If you do that, you'll be able to see our Forbes articles as well as the video content. So I appreciate you guys watching for sure. For sure. God bless and peace.